Thank you everyone for coming. Um, thank you for coming to our Halloween themed faculty talk, um, a neuroscientific view of the zombie brain. Uh, my name is Tamara Rhodes. I'm the subject librarian for psychology, COGSI, human developmental sciences ling and linguistics. Um, and I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker this afternoon. Um, a few years ago, Tim Versteinen and Brad Wojtek published a book titled, Do Zombies Dream of Undead Sheep? which combined tug-in-cheek analysis with modern neuroscientific principles to show how zombieism can be understood in terms of current knowledge and regarding how the brain works. We are so lucky to have Brad as a faculty member here. So when our academic outreach coordinator, Sarah Finn, out there, who you met, um, suggested this is the perfect talk for something like right before Halloween for the library, we were so excited about the idea. Um, so Brad is an associate professor in the Department of Cognitive Science, the Neurosciences Graduate Program, and the Data Science Institute here at UC San Diego. You didn't try and pronounce the name. No, I left <laughs> it out purposely. I'm glad you caught that. <laughs> I typed it out and I was like, no. Nah. Um, and he was also formerly a data scientist at Uber. His, science, his research centers around the computational role that neural oscillations play in coordinating information transfer in the brain. And for his talk, he'll be sharing how he used neuroscience to dissect the puzzle of what has happened to the zombie brain to make the undead act differently than their human prey. So please join me in welcoming Brad Wojtek. Thank you. Actually, can I see that? I want this really quick. So uh, people usually ask, how, how did this happen? <laughs> like, why, why am I doing this? Um, so I just want to point out, okay, so if I come into a classroom uh, and want to talk to students at like high school or like all the way down to the elementary school level, and I walk in and I say, hi, I'm Professor Wojtek, and I study the role, of the computational role that neural oscillations play in coordinating information transfer in the brain, nobody knows what I'm talking about, right? And so if I start talking about my work in the way I actually would describe it to other scientists, uh, it's, I've already lost every single student in that room, right? Especially, you know, I've got a seven-year-old now, like, he stopped listening before I even showed up, right? I'm like, uh, but you talk to a group of kids in a classroom and they don't know what any of that stuff means, right? Uh, they don't have any way to connect it. And so I do a lot of outreach. I, I work with a lot of students at a lot of different schools. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons I do that is because I really like my job. Uh, like I, I really like being a professor. I like teaching and I love doing research. And if I could spend all day every day in the lab, uh, well, that's not entirely true. If I could spend five days a week in the lab for eight hours a day for the rest of my life, I'd be pretty happy with that. Um, it's a really fun job. And I didn't get into this job because of the computational role that neural oscillations play in whatever, right? That's not why I started doing this. Uh, so how do you get people sort of to come into a field to try and appreciate the complexities and the beauty of what it is that you study? Uh, because like soapbox time, right? We live in a society where I'm lucky enough that we've all agreed as a society that taxes will pay for the research that we do. Uh, it doesn't have to have an immediately obvious benefit. Uh, I'd like to think that our research is meaningful and actually will help people someday, but if it doesn't, that's okay. And so how do you get people involved in that pipeline? And so part of it is by engaging them at a level that they find interesting, right? And so if I start talking about uh, like the cerebellum and the basal ganglia and how those differentially cord like help you coordinate motor control, uh, again, Students at the, anybody really, nobody, nobody except for like a couple dozen people in the world really care about that. But if I tell you that I think, my hypothesis, is that the reasons that there are fast zombies versus slow zombies is differential effects on the cerebellum versus basal ganglia, and then people are like, why? And you explain what those two brain areas do, suddenly you get like 12 year olds arguing with each other about the basal ganglia and cerebellum, right? And so this is how this whole thing got started. Um, and so uh, a couple disclaimers right at the beginning. Uh, all the science that I'm about to show is really 100% real. The methods, the brain areas, all of the disorders that I talk about are true, uh, except for obviously the zombie part is not. Although sometimes really the truth can be scarier than fiction, so you've been warned on that front. Uh, and there might be, I, I, I said online today, probably not, I think I've removed most of it, but it may contain a clip or two that I forgot to remove of like graphic violence and gore and pictures of real brains. Definitely pictures of real brains. Uh, so if that bothers you, then, you know, now is the time. Um, so really, why zombie neuroscience? So like I said, it's how do you get general audiences engaged in basic science? So one of the nice things is you, know, you can use pop culture to talk about science, uh, but of course science has also informed pop culture quite a bit. Um, and you know, zombies are so hot right now uh, also, right? Like I, The Walking Dead is still, I think, the most popular show out there, uh, the number one most viewed, and it's on season 
seven, eight? What are they on now? I don't even know. Um, and the first foray into this, uh, to be totally frank, started because I'm a smart ass. Like I, I was a smart ass in grad school and that was like compensating for not getting as much work done as my, my peers. Uh, so every year, I did my PhD in neuroscience at Berkeley. And every year the UC Berkeley Neurosciences graduate program would have an annual retreat where all the grad students and the professors and researchers go away for a weekend up at Lake Tahoe. And on the first night, the new first year PhD students have the opportunity to do a poster during a like evening dinner session uh, in a poster hall. Uh, you know, everybody's like having a you know glass of wine and like a little cheese plate, and the grad students are up there talking about, they're standing in front of a poster talking about their research. And in my cohort, my first year of 10 students, I was the only one that didn't have enough research done to do a poster. So I'm like, oh, this is off to a great start of grad school. And so what I had done was uh, that same location the night before, the United States Geological Survey, the USGS, had done a poster session. So they had their retreat in the same location. And somebody had forgotten their poster. And it was about like drilling core samples in the Arctic to look at climate change over the, you know, over the millennia. And so I just stood next to that poster, like it was my neuroscience poster. And I was like, well, you know, we wanted to study the effects of like super cold temperature on brain function. So we went to Antarctica and we buried it at brain, brain imaging machine in the ice. And we flew people down to scan there. And I was just totally joking. It was like, it was supposed to be a joke, right? And I thought it was obviously like clearly a joke, but like there were several people that came up and they were like, oh really? And I was like, yeah. And then the core, the, 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 <laughs> the core broke down. And so like we had to dig like with shovels, but we had to take turns because it was so cold out there. And my future PhD advisor, he wasn't my PhD advisor yet, he's, wa he's watching me do this and he's like, what are, you, what are you doing? And then he's like, but that's actually pretty good. <laughs> Cause he, he, there was another professor that, you know, that they sort of didn't get along and he's like, you totally got him going for a really long time. <laughs> and then he started going around telling everybody to come over to my poster. Uh, and so he was like, see how long you can get all the different professors to believe that you were actually doing this. Uh, and so, uh, I don't know how to explain it other than uh, I, I enjoy that sort of like ad-libbing kind of thing. And so fast, fast forward a couple of years later and uh, my friend Tim and I, he's now a professor at Carnegie Mellon, somehow we both still managed to get jobs in this field. Um, we made a poster, a science poster, science looking poster anyway, titled Conscious, Consciousness Deficit Hypoactivity Disorder or CDHD. Uh, and this is all nonsense, right? Like we, we have a picture of a zombie lying down on a brain scanner we told them like it was really hard to get the zombies to lie still in the brain scanner to get a good picture. So we had to like cut their head off and duct tape it to suspend it in the brain scanner. Like by the time we got to that point, most of the neuroscience, neuroscientists got it. But we were trying to see how long we could keep people sort of going on this. And we did this poster at the Society for Neuroscience Conference, which is a 35,000 person conference every year. Uh, it rotates between different cities. It's here in San Diego again uh, this year down at the convention center. Um, so you have neuroscientists from all around the world that are coming to this conference. And we just hung this poster up and just stood next to it talking about zombies. And people were like, wait, is this, is this real? Uh, but the greatest thing was, this is a photo that we took of our, of our poster hanging up at this convention center. And this is a security guard working the event who came over and started reading the poster and then got his friends and had them come over and read this poster. And never in the history of this conference has a security guard and his friends stopped and read one of these neuroscience posters, right? Because all of them are sort of bland and dry, right? And we, so we sort of snuck this photo of this guy doing this because we're like, this is amazing. Like this guy is like, what is going on over here? Uh, and he actually started reading this poster and the science in the poster is legitimate. And so we're like, this is actually working. Like people are actually like thinking about this. Um, and it's been a very weird ride. So this, I got to meet George Romero. Uh, he's the guy that directed the original Night of the Living Dead movie. Um, and we had the opportunity actually, uh, uh, my wife and I were on vacation in 2010, this is pre-kids in uh, Japan. And I got a phone call and they're like, hey, uh, we, we're running, it's just this random guy. And he's like, hey, we're running a conference called ZombieCon uh, in Seattle, you wanna come? Uh, and we're like, eh, we're in Japan, we're having, like, we're gonna be in Japan at the time. And they're like, yeah, but we're gonna have like George Romero and we'd love it if you could, uh, you can come and like, you know, meet George Romero and do all this. And we're like, cut our Japan trip short. Yes, we're going to Seattle. Uh, and so uh, there, was, there was a special session at this con, a special session, it was like an emergency session at the zombie con to uh, have a argument about fast zombies versus slow zombies and whether fast zombies are really zombies or not. Uh, zombie culture, this is a very serious discussion. Um, and George Romero was the guest, guest panelist like 
on there, and they were supposed to have somebody up on stage interviewing them, but that interviewer never showed up. And so the people organizing the conference were in a panic because we're all sitting in a room and George Romero's up on stage by himself. Uh, and there's a room packed full of people and nobody's there. And the guy came over to my friend Tim and I and they're like, can you guys interview George Romero for us? And we're like, yeah, we can do this. <laughs> and so we just got to chat with Romero who uh, unfortunately passed away uh, last summer. But we got to chat with him for like an hour about zombies and fast zombies versus slow zombies. And the original Night of the Living Dead, you know, zombies are the classic, what we think of like the uh, kind of zombies, right? And so I asked him, uh, you know, I was like, okay, well, Mr. Romero, um, why in your original movies did you make zombies slow? And he's like, are you dumb, Mr. Dr. PhD? He's like, because they're dead. And I was like, hard to argue that, all right. <laughs> um, but when we actually began doing this, my friend Tim and I, this all started as, as quite frankly, an accident. Uh, so we used to do movie nights, this group of grad students, and uh, we got one year into sort of like this zombie uh, run of a couple of movies together as friends. And uh, apparently when you get groups of neuroscientists together watching zombie movies, inevitably it devolves into arguments about why they behave the way they do and what their brains would look like. Like why do their brains look, like what would their brains have to look like in order to make them behave this way? And uh, so my friend Tim and I, we, we decided that we would try and like actually formalize this as a, as a series of blog posts and a joke and for this poster at this conference. And we, we did the poster and then we, we published a series of uh, like blog posts in our blog. Um, and we decided to take what we call this like forensic uh, neuroscience approach, right? So you have zombies and you start with this and you try and figure out like, okay, well, let's watch, a, like do, do some very serious uh, zombie research, um, which meant uh, watching a lot of zombie movies. Pretty much everyone out there, I think we've seen at this point. And we said, well, what are, what are the traits? Like what are the classic traits of zombieism? So we said hyperaggression, memory deficits, reduced impulse control, language disruption, movement dysfunction, attention problems, visual recognition impairments. Uh, in like the sort of zomb, the, the like neuroscience terminology for these things. Right? And we, oh, I did it again. I have been doing this talk for years and I keep intending to fix this slide. <laughs> and I keep forgetting to fix the dangling Y. Um, so we have this cluster and we know a lot about the neuroscience side of like, uh, like how does the brain give rise to uh, like motor control, our ability to move? Uh, how does it give rise to speech and language? How does it give rise to attention, memory, memory, uh, aggression, addictive behaviors, impulse control? We have a fair amount of knowledge built up over the years. The neuroscience peer reviewed literature is about 3 million papers deep. Uh, there's, you know, 200 years of formal neuroscience research that has been done uh, in all these different domains. Um, and so we know a lot about how the brain gives rise to these things. And so we did, you know, this sort of like observational research of zombies in the wild, right? So this is one of my favorite clips. <laughs> I love Shaun of the Dead. This, by the way, uh, people often ask me, like, what is your favorite zombie movie? And I have to feel like I have to say for, like, hipster cred, the original Night of the Living Dead, or, like, if I want to go way back, like, White Zombie in 1929. Uh, but this, honestly, is probably, probably it. Uh, this is definitely a joke, right? The whole movie's a comedy. Uh, it's part of, the, what do they call it, the Cornetto trilogy. Uh, and it's very clear that all of these folks involved in this movie absolutely love the zombie genre. Like, every single scene in this movie is, like, five movies deep of jokes about zombies. Um, and this scene is great. So they have just discovered their first two zombies and uh, they're trying to fight them off. And they're like, well, how do, we, how do we hold them off, right? And so you start with something like this of like, okay, this guy gets a toaster in his face, right? What would happen if I got a toaster thrown in my face, right? Like how would I behave? Probably I would uh, something like this, right? And start cursing uh, and step back and it would hurt. There's no response. And so we say, okay, well, why isn't that zombie responding? We have, we've spent way too much time thinking about this nonsense. Um, okay, you so, say, well, maybe the, maybe the zombie doesn't feel pain. But this is where it got to be like the fun neuroscience side of things. Of pain is actually a crucial thing uh, for our everyday, like not only survival, obviously, like, uh, you know, there's certain things like uh, really severe uh, long-term diabetes can cause peripheral pain loss, right? So doctors will often check the bottoms of the feet of people that have very severe diabetes because you could step on some, I have kids, so like this just happened to me a couple days ago, like I was doing bedtime and I walked out of my daughter's room and I stepped on 
I don't know why the toy had like two fangs like this, but I stepped on it and I walked out and my wife is like, why are you trailing blood? And I'm like, two little bite marks it looks like on the bottom of my foot. If I had severe diabetes, I wouldn't have noticed that. Uh, and you can go for a very long time and you can get gangrenous and things. So the doctor will check the bottom of your feet. So like obviously being able to feel pain is critical for day-to-day -day life, but it's also critical for being able to move, uh, believe it or not. So like, um, you know, to prevent yourself from hyperextending or something like that, you start to get a pain response if you stretch too far and you will compensate. So not only is pain critical for, you know, our basic survival, but it's also critical for just being able to coordinate our bodies. We actually get a lot of, we call it proprioceptive. It's the, the sensation from our periphery and you know, from our bodies feedback that says, hey, you know, you can't move this way, you can't do this kind of thing. And so the fact that zombies can still move relatively normally, albeit slower, uh, suggests to us that they still have some pain sensations getting into their brain. So it's not that they've lost pain, it's just that they're able to suppress, uh, intentionally or not, the feelings of pain. And so these are the kinds of conversations they went through of like really, really dissecting uh, all these kinds of behaviors. And we came up with this sort of joke, smart ass, um, science, medical science sounding acronym of CDHD or consciousness deficit hypo, meaning less activity disorder, which we defined as the loss of rational, voluntary, and conscious behavior replaced by delusional impulsive aggression, stimulus driven attention, and the inability to coordinate motor or linguistic behaviors. Um, and so we're like, okay, well, what if we could like scan a zombie brain, what that looks like? This is like first season of The Walking Dead. This is not what brain scanning looks like, uh, by the way. Like it's not this like real time, either. in this scene in the first season, like, they show the zombie in the scanner and then a bullet goes through the head in the middle of the scanner and you see the bullet go through and you're like, that's not the way that any of this works. Um, I love the way that PopSci sort of portrays real science, right? And there really is a really cool feedback between PopSci and real science, right? Like uh, William Gibson, who's a very famous science fiction author, has long since given up writing science fiction. And I think his quote is something along the lines of like, I can't keep up with how weird real science is. So for me to be able to like predict in the future the science fiction side of things is just too difficult. Uh, but you have ideas that generated from science fiction that will actually feed back and like influence real scientists. I mean, personally, that's part of how I got into science as a kid was growing up reading comic books and watching sci-fi movies and things like this. Uh, I remember like hopping on the bus as a 13 year old with my friends. I grew up in San Diego for a couple of years as a teenager and hopping on the bus to go downtown to this tiny little convention called Comic-Con, uh, which was this thing that we could like in 1994, hop on a bus and just walk in and buy a ticket uh, and go to talk to the artists that were drawing the comic books. It's a little bit bigger now. Um, uh, but like, I remember like reading things like the Iron Man comics and stuff like this and saying like, that's really cool. Like, could you do this? And watching the Matrix in college and being like, can you really upload? Kung Fu in somebody's brain, like obviously that seems ridiculous, but then you see people doing brain computer interfacing research and you're like, well, maybe someday, I don't know, right? And so that interplay between science fiction, and fantasy and science, I think is actually pretty tight. Um, and so anyway, uh, we were talking about what if we could scan the zombie brain, right? Well, we could get uh, from an MRI or fMRI, so magnetic resonance imaging lets you scan uh, the structures of the brain. You can, you can image non-invasively uh, different parts of the brain, the white matter and the gray matter, which is like the neurons or the, the connections and the neurons themselves respectively. Uh, and you can also look at functional magnetic resonance imaging and you can put somebody in the scanner and have them do things like move their fingers and you can see what parts of the brain are more active when they're moving their fingers versus not. Um, so these are the methods, these are the methods in our toolkit as scientists, uh, neuroscientists to study. You can look at the connections. Uh, this is really cool. Uh, these are like the white matter fibers in a, in a real brain of a living person that you can image non-invasively using these methods. Um, and so we can do these really cool brain imaging things. We know a lot about from these methods, like which brain areas are responsible or active, more active during different kinds of behaviors. And so we said, well, let's reverse it and say, uh, we know what brain areas are required to do, you know, language. Zombies can't do language, so maybe something is wrong with that brain area. Uh, and so, my friend Tim is actually, he's an expert in MR imaging, you know, this kind of thing. And he called me up one day and he's like, hey, so I, I made a 3D rendering of a zombie brain. I just took like the standard template human brain and I just removed the parts of the brain that, you know, we've been talking about. And he's like, it was really easy to do this. He's like, it was way too easy to fake this data uh, and make this thing. Like, it's much easier than like actually doing a real study. He's like, this is troublesome and somewhat concerning. Um, but this is what we think the, the zombie brain would probably look like. So to orient you, this is the back and this is the front. 
Uh, this little cauliflower shaped thing back here is called the cerebellum. It literally means little brain. Uh, and that, cont that contains about half of all the neurons in your brain. Will you step up here for a minute? I'm gonna see if we can do a little experiment. I'm gonna tell you what the, what the uh, cerebellum does. So stand over here. Oh, you're dragging your phone. <laughs> so, so this thing contains, like I said, about half of all the neurons in your brain. So you have about 86 billion neurons in your brain, give or take. Uh, stand facing me, close your eyes. Oh wow, you're very trusting, okay. Close your eyes. Uh, okay, no, I'm just kidding. Hold, open your eyes really quick. And do, do this for me, hands up. So I'm gonna push down in your hands, just let me do that and push back so you don't fall, okay? Close your eyes. Okay, push, 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 push. Okay, you can open your eyes, thank you. She did not go falling backwards. If you do not have a cerebellum, you need somebody behind you to catch you or else you will absolutely go flying backwards and fall. Um, and this is a test that uh, neurologists will do to check without brain imaging the fidelity of your cerebellum and your motor system. The reason that this little tiny thing back here, we think the reason that it has so many neurons is because motor control, coordinating all of our muscles together is actually incredibly complicated. Um, so I have a seven year old, like I said, he wants to learn how to skateboard. I skateboarded 25 years ago. Uh, and so if I'm gonna teach him how to skateboard, I'm like, well, I gotta remember how to do it again. And so I got a skateboard too. And I am very uncoordinated again on this thing. And you, like, imagine building a robot that could ride a skateboard, right? Imagine how difficult that is. Like think about if like skiing, skateboarding, snowboarding, uh, roller skating, uh, anything that we do that is sort of quicker than maybe normal, the amount of corrections you have to do, like every bump you go over, uh, or even just something as simple as taking a step and then bending down to pick something up off of the ground, like a little piece of fuzz. Um, what do you have to do? If you're building a robot that could do this whenever it needed to, you're like, okay, well, uh, in order to bend over, you're like, what is the total weight? Where's my center of gravity? What is the total weight above the center of gravity? And how does that change as a function of my angle, of, you know, like rotation here? I got to sort of like counterbalance and take weight off my back foot in order to bend over and I have to move my hand down 17.25. All of this is happening unconsciously. We don't have to think about this, thankfully. It's a huge amount of computational processing that is required to do this dynamically in real time. Uh, and so half your neurons right there. If you are missing it, you, you would fall backwards if you did that thing. But otherwise, you sort of walk like this. You have this uh, to steady yourself. People with uh, cerebellar damage, usually due to some kind of stroke or trauma, uh, have to walk sort of wider. Um, often the neurologist will give them a little ID card, a special thing, uh, like a little medical disclaimer that says essentially that they're not intoxicated because oftentimes people with cerebellar damage will get stopped by the police uh, out of concerns of public drunkenness or intoxication because of the way that they walk. Um, and so this is an area here that is really critical for controlling our movements, but it's amazing to me uh, as a neuroscientist that you can have somebody that is missing fully 40 to 50 billion neurons, and they're like, mostly okay. <laughs> like, you wouldn't really notice. Like, maybe if they're walking a little little differently, you would notice, but it's, it's shocking, because if you lose the wrong, like, 25 neurons in the brainstem, you're gonna die, <laughs> right? Uh, so the brainstem is a part of the brain that is, like, required and critical for maintaining things like heart rate, respiration, uh, temperature control in the body, homeostasis uh, in general, right? So you can lose half the neurons in your brain here, not so bad. I mean, you know, if I had the choice, I wouldn't choose to, but if I was going to have choice of some kind of brain damage, if I had to pick, that might be mine. Um, and then you can see other parts of the areas that are a little bit more tricky to see, maybe for, for uh, people not familiar, but sort of atrophy in the frontal lobe and sort of uh, on sort of the superior temporal plane here and a little bit of the motor cortex. So this is why we, th this is what we think the zombie brain would look like. And now we can get a little bit into why. Um, this is another way of looking at it. Uh, these are called coronal slices. It's like if I shaved off the <laughs> top of my head here and just sort of took pictures. Uh, in here in the gray behind is what we think the, is not what we think, we know, pretty sure, uh, what the human brain looks like. Uh, and orange here is overlaid on top. This is what we think the zombie brain would look like. And you can see, uh, we make the argument that there are certain brain areas that are atrophied. Uh, so we argue that these brain changes can explain specific patterns of behavior. Um, this is one of those gory slides that I thought I'd taken out, but we'll just go with it. Uh, so uh, 
Push Comes to Shove, second favorite movie. This one, 28 Days Later, fantastic zombie film. Um, this is a pretty gory scene. So. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> okay, so that guy gets blood vomited on, I don't know how to describe it, and then about 10 seconds later, he turns into a zombie. Uh, that's different from the original Night of the Living Dead, where people are dead for days before turning into zombies. Hold that in mind, we'll get back to that later. Um, so why are zombies aggressive? Uh, so here's the disclaimer. As a neuroscientist talking at the like lay science level, I can say, look, we know a lot about like the origins of like aggression and impulse control in neuroscience. Reality in the lab, that's not the case. We don't really know much about any of this kind of stuff. We'll say this. <laughs> so take all of this with like a very large grain of salt. Uh, but our current level of understanding of things like impulse control and like the origins of aggression and violence uh, from a neuroscience standpoint is so broad and vague. Like trying to scientifically operationalize aggression is incredibly difficult. What they usually do is they'll take rats, right, in cages, and they'll watch the rats fight and they figure out the ones that fight more and they're like, well, that's a pretty good index for aggression because obviously that's what happens in humans when they're good aggressive uh, and we'll take this as a proxy. It's way more complicated than that, but we'll start here. We do suspect strongly that this part of the brain called the orbitofrontal cortex is very cleverly named because it's at the front, right above the orbits of the eye, uh, orbitofrontal cortex. Normally is communicating with this like little almond shaped thing uh, deep in the center of the brain called the amygdala. Uh, it's amygdala means almond. Uh, and uh, also this part of the brain called the hypothalamus. You have this really heavy set of interconnecting brain regions. And if the orbital frontal cortex is gone, look at that animation, super fancy. Uh, the amygdala is hyper activated because normally our orbital frontal cortex, these frontal regions of our brain are suppressing our impulsive behaviors constantly. Um, and by that, I mean, <laughs> I just promised the guy I wasn't gonna go to the back of the room and eat a cookie, but now I really feel like I want to. Um, because normally I'd be like, ah, cookies are delicious. Why don't I just eat cookies? And I have to think, well, if I just ate cookies, uh, then maybe I would start to gain weight and that's an unhealthy diet and I wouldn't be getting enough nutrients. And so I, I can cognitively think about all these things and then suppress my impulsive behaviors. Uh, but if that part of the brain is damaged, which can happen in very rare cases, one of the most famous cases in the history of neuroscience is Phineas Gage, um, who had all of the like undergrads in the room uh, that are cog sci students. They're like, yeah, we know, Professor Voicek, we've heard this before. Um, uh, also probably wrong, by the way, but uh, at the level that you're learning it as an undergrad, that's right. Uh, Iron Bar accidentally got shot up through his skull. This is back in like 1860 something. I don't remember the exact date. Uh, he was a foreman at a railroad company and uh, they would use explosives. They would drill holes into granite uh, mountainsides, stuff those holes full of uh, TNT and they would tamp the TNT down to pack it very tight using these long iron rods. Um, and iron rod in granite sparked, lit the TNT and it shot the rod back up through the hole that they had drilled, straight up through the top of his head, uh, up through, actually sort of at the angle up through his orbit of his eye, and then right through the orbital frontal cortex and out the top. And uh, despite the best efforts of his doctor that oversaw him at the time to murder him, if you read the original uh, reports of what the, the doctor had done, done, you can't blame it that we didn't know, but the doctor was like, well, this obviously got some bone fragments in his head because it pushed some bone fragments up into his brain. So what I need to do is just go down in there and dig all those bone fragments out of the brain. Um, we don't, that's bad, you don't do that. Um, we know that now. Uh, but anyway, regardless, he somehow survived. Uh, Phineas Gage survived this and uh, supposedly like the sort of like lore goes, his behavior dramatically changed. He was like a good family man and so on and so forth. And he like moved to San Francisco and became uh, like a compulsive gambler and left his family uh, and died at a very young age. And so the lore in neuroscience history is like, well, that's because the damage to his frontal lobes disrupted his impulse control. And he became a very impulsive person. Now I gotta say, that seems like pretty severe trauma. Uh, 
I figure even if it wasn't for the actual like brain damage, that would probably change your behavior and outlook on life in general. Um, so to make the leap that like, therefore this is the part of the brain that does impulse control, it seems pretty wild to me, but decades of intervening research does tell us that this orbital frontal cortex is very important for impulse control. Um, and so this whole network uh, that is responsible for impulse control because of the loss of the prefrontal cortex, this network of brain regions gets hyperactivated, and therefore we'd argue that the zombie would be hyperaggressive. More impulsive rage, uh, chronic stress response, appetite dysregulation. Uh, so we think just the loss of this one region gives rise to this cluster of zombie things, right? Like their insatiable appetite for human flesh. Um, so zombie survival tip number one is don't fight them. They're stronger than you. They're more uh, like aggressive than you. Uh, they can last longer than you, so don't fight them. This is a great scene from Land of the Dead uh, in which the human survivors have sort of clustered together. This is, there is Night of the Living Dead, uh, the, which was the original George Romero movie, and then there was Dawn of the Dead, and then there is, I think, was it Day of the Dead, and then Land of the Dead. Land of the Dead was like late 90s, uh, 2000s, so Romero kept making these for decades. Um, by this point in the series, Land of the Dead, you have this group of human survivors that like, had sort of rebuilt their own little mini society within the zombie apocalypse. And when they go out raiding for supplies and things like that, they go out at night. And the question is like, wait, the guy's asking, why would you go out at night? Uh, can we get the volume up on the... How do I turn that one up? So in general, so now look on those things. I've been walking, but there's a big difference between us and them. They're dead. It's like they're pretending to be. So they're out at night. They go raiding into town, and I'll get to the like why they go out at night in a second. But there's a scene where they walk through, and uh, I think it takes place in Jersey. So Jersey is one of the few states where you still are not allowed to pump your own gas, which. Um, uh, I have friends from Jersey, but maybe that's a good decision. Uh, and so they have gas station attendants. I'm, I'm not making fun of anybody from Jersey. I'm just kidding. Um, they have gas station attendants uh, who come out and pump your gas for you. And so what happened was somebody stepped on the bell, right? Something triggered the bell. Zombie walks out, does a sort of like habit of pulling out the thing to pump the gas, but then is very confused and looks around. This is a great scene sort of describing a certain kind of amnesia. Um, so there's, broadly speaking, two kinds, kinds of amnesia. There's uh, anterograde amnesia, which is you forget things in the past, and, uh, or sorry, in the future, and then retrograde is you forget things in the past. Um, and this is an example of uh, one of the types of amnesia where you see some old habitual habits still in place, but there's sort of general confusion, right? So you don't quite remember why you're doing the things that you're doing. Uh, and so the argument here uh, comes from another very classic case in the history of neuroscience. This is patient HM, uh, as he was known for decades in the neuroscience literature because they wanted to protect his privacy. After he passed away, uh, actually shortly before he passed away, um, they released his name. His name is Henry Malaison, and there's been a number of fascinating books written about him. He had a surgery done back in the 1960s uh, where uh, he had very severe epilepsy. And so the surgeons went in to remove the part of the brain that was causing his epilepsy, so seizures. He had like multiple seizures a day that were very severe. And so in order to stop the seizures from happening, uh, the surgeon would identify the exact part of the brain causing the seizures and then remove the part of the brain, very simply speaking. They still do this to this day. Um, even here at UCSD, we work with the neurosurgeon, Sharona ben Haim, who does these kinds of surgeries. Uh, but they don't do this exact one anymore, which was they removed both his left and right hippocampuses. Uh, because those were where the seizures were coming from. And when he woke up, he could remember everything that happened prior to his surgery, but he could no longer form any new memories from the moment of the surgery onward. So he had a memory span of several seconds to maybe two to five minutes, and then it would blink. And he'd look around and ask everybody who they were again and what he was doing there. And he lived like this for decades. Uh, so he had this uh, anterograde amnesia, 
Uh, so it is very uncommon to have retrograde amnesia for something like this happens in cartoons and stuff all the time, right? Like you're bonked in the head, you have little birdies flying around your head, and then you don't remember who you are, where you came from. That doesn't really happen, it's very rare in real life. And tarot amnesia though is something that can happen, which is the inability to form new memories. So you remember things, everything prior to some sort of traumatic event, but uh, forming new memories afterward is difficult. And so uh, this taught neuroscientists immediately that these hippocampuses are critical for the formation of memory. We know this now. Part of the reason why you do know this, actually a lot of what we really truly know in neuroscience, like actually know know, comes from working with patients who had some kind of brain trauma like this, either surgery or um, a stroke or uh, part of the reason we know that the visual system is organized the way it does is because of the way that hats, helmets in World War I were designed for soldiers. Those little bowl helmets that would sit atop the head. Uh, as medicine improved, people were able to survive uh, worse and worse kinds of traumatic injury. Uh, but those little bowl shaped helmets that were being worn kept part of the visual parts of the brain here in the back uncovered. So if soldiers got shrapnel that damaged, the doctors could keep them alive. Uh, but the shrapnel would damage just very specific parts of the visual system. And the, one of the doctors in the field noticed that if they had shrapnel here, they were only blind and they would just not be able to see anything right here. And if they had shrapnel right here, they would only lose like this part of space. And right here would be just that part of space. And this doctor in World War I working with these soldiers who were able to survive because of the tremendous advances in medicine, but who, because of the design of the helmets, specifically would only get damage to the visual cortex was able to map out how the brain maps visual space. Um, so a huge amount of what we know in neuroscience uh, comes from this, going all the way back to the days of the gladiatorial combat days. Uh, it turns out that's a group of people who had a lot of traumatic brain injury uh, in ancient Rome. And one of the surgeons and doctors that would treat them named Galen also figured out a lot of these mappings between how the body senses and moves to very damage to very specific parts of the brain in gladiatorial combat. Uh, it's pretty wild, the history of neuroscience that comes from all this stuff. So we know that uh, HM, Henry, uh, Malaison, had this kind of uh, memory deficit, which the movie Memento from the late 90s actually did a shockingly good job at portraying um, what that must be like. Uh, I mean, minus all of the tattoos and guns and stuff like that. Um, it is a really good movie, and, and they do a very good job uh, talking to any neurologist who's seen patients like this, they say like they did a pretty good job of actually portraying that sort of what it's like for the patients. Um, and so we'd argue that normal, normally humans, the hippocampuses are intact, uh, but something in the zombieism has, has disrupted the function of those hippocampal regions. Uh, and so we'd say, okay, there's near complete loss of the hippocampus. Um, and <laughs> another little neuroscience footnote. Uh, this is like a great little bit of like neuroscience theory history. There's this guy named James Papes, who is like, you know, it's kind of interesting. I notice, it's like philosophy, right? Like I, uh, it's like interrogation internally. I notice that I remember things that were emotional better. I remember my birthdays very clearly, uh, but I don't remember like the day before or day after necessarily, right? And so the classic uh, case, all of you in this room are probably too young, not all of you, <laughs> but I'll do it anyway. Uh, for those of you who are not too young, where were you on September 11th, 2001? Pretty clearly remember like every event of that morning probably of your life. I remember exactly what happened when I woke up, who came into my room to talk to me, what they said, going to class that day, what the professor said. I remember that day very clearly. I can't tell you what happened 10 years later. Uh, you know, September 11th, 2011, I don't know. I don't quite remember. Um, Unless that happens to be your birthday, you're not going to remember either, or like some other like really important life event. And so Papes noticed this, and he's like, so the emotional parts of the brain and the memory parts of the brain, uh, those are probably like pretty heavily connected. Uh, and so uh, he sort of reasoned through what like what sort of that feels like, and he argued this hypothetical neuroanatomical circuit, which we now call the Papes circuit, which is a connection between the memory parts of the brain. Uh, and the emotional parts of the brain, and a couple of other regions that he argued must be important uh, from a theoretical perspective. And then neuroanatomists later are like, yep, he was right. Uh, those are pretty heavily connected. Uh, and the way that neuroanatomists actually figured this out, the way that we can figure out what parts of the brain are connected to other parts of the brain, is uh, historically they would inject the rabies virus into a brain region, 
And that would cause retrograde damage. So it's a it's funky thing that the rabies virus, and very specifically the rabies virus and not very many other things do, is once it gets into a part of the body, it actually, whatever the brain regions are that are connected behind it, it actually goes backwards and damages those two. And so you can use that and say, okay, inject it here to try and figure out what are the brain regions that put inputs into this brain region uh, if you inject rabies in there. So from a, like, and they did this in cats actually. <laughs> Poor kitties. Um, in order to figure this out, right, and we think it's kind of funny because like these specific cluster of brain regions that we argue are damaged, uh, are damaged by rabies, which is like the big thing that people think might cause zombieism, so we don't think it's an accident. Zombie cats, right? Um, so survival tip number two is arguing uh, that you should probably keep quiet and wait it out because the zombies will forget that you were there uh, a couple minutes later. Uh, so this is how we can use and leverage all the things we know in science to survive the zombie apocalypse, right? Okay, so I'm going to end on the last symptom that we talked about, uh, this uh, zombies don't come out at night. Or, I mean, uh, humans come out at night, uh, which seems incorrect. You'd want to come out during the day when you could see better, but they only come out at, uh, the humans only come out at night. And the question is why? How come you guys always go out at night? Wouldn't it be safer in the daytime? Fireworks, kid. These dentists can't keep their eyes off of you. <laughs> so they start setting off fireworks, and the zombies cannot help but watch the fireworks. They can't help it. All their attention is drawn to those fireworks. So, little side note, the, tramp, uh, the, the tambourine guy, the zombie apocalypse is happening all around you. Imagine this, right? Like, everything is going to hell. Like, it's really scary. And you're going to keep on tambourining, like, going down with the ship. Like, that guy had to have been holding the tambourine when he got eaten by the zombie, right? Like... Why is he still holding the tambourine? Like, as the apocalypse is happening around you, you think he'd drop the tambourine and run. I don't understand why there's a tambourine zombie, but anyway. Um, why are the zombies' attention being drawn uh, by these fireworks? So, uh, this is another super fascinating thing that rarely happens, but does happen, uh, where this region here is called the parietal cortex, the posterior parietal cortex, technically, uh, and it would normally be right here. Uh, and here we think it's atrophied in the zombies. Uh, if both the left and right side of your parietal cortices are damaged somehow, like this very rarely ever happens, but it can happen. It, can in, it, it causes what is known as Balance Syndrome, which is you have stimulus-locked attention. So, oh, I need to set it up one year to actually have this happen. If somebody came running into the back room screaming, everybody would immediately turn around and look at them, right? So just so I'm like, so you can be sure that I'm not fooling you, everybody like take a look in the back and you can see that there's nobody actually like, if I do that, everybody jumps, right? And they look immediately at me. Uh, and that's because that sound has involuntarily captured your attention. Now, if I tell you, look back in the room and I'm gonna do it again, right? You don't actually have to do it. I'm not gonna do it again. Uh, you would be able to suppress that jump startle behavior, right? If you know it's about to happen. Um, but uh, the, the, we think that happens because of this part of the brain says, okay, attention, calm down. Like we're gonna, we're gonna be able to focus on this thing uh, and then if we need to not focus on it, we can divert our attention anywhere, even if we're about to be surprised. It's not surprising anymore because we know it's going to happen, right? The brain is really good at predicting the future. Um, if this part of the brain is damaged on both sides, you cannot control the direction of your attention. It is constantly being captured by things in your visual environment, uh, an auditory environment. And even more strangely, if you talk to these patients and have this, they also report what is known as stroboscopic vision which is the world is not one smooth, continuous like set of sensory inputs and vision. It's like flashes. It's like photographs being slowly flashed in front of you. So they don't have a continuously smooth experience of the world around us. It's just these little snapshots uh, of visual experience. Um, and so we know that this part of the brain is required to do this kind of like direction of attention. So the argument being there, if you can't otherwise get away from them, maybe the best thing to do would be to just maybe distract them, right? So I'm gonna end on <laughs> our argument for what do we do in the future? <laughs> this is such a silly movie, by the way. Fido is, is also another zombie movie worth watching where the zombie apocalypse has happened and instead of like uh, causing the end of the world, 
a group of humans figured out that if you just sort of put these little collars on the zombies, you can control the zombies. And they make for really good like helpers around the house to do your dishes and fold laundry and stuff like that. It's totally ridiculous uh, movie. And so uh, so we, we tried to figure out like, can you make a remote controlled zombie? What would that be required? Um, but that ended up being too ridiculous of an exercise. Uh, in That's saying something because this entire thing is totally ridiculous. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, there's a couple of like traits of zombies that we didn't talk about. We didn't talk about the motor control thing. We didn't talk about the fast versus slow zombies. Uh, there's not enough time. But I will do one last little teaser about the fast and slow zombies thing, which was like our favorite, uh, which was why might there be fast and slow zombies? Uh, and so we go back to that idea of in uh, um, uh, the, what was it? Uh, 28 days later, you have the zombie in like 10 seconds becomes a zombie, right? Uh, so we say that there's actually different subtypes of CDHD uh, that are defined as to whether or not the uh, whatever causes the zombieism, how quickly it operates on damaging the cerebellum. Uh, and so if you actually go through uh, the fast zombies, we would argue have better motor coordination and better spatial abilities uh, due to the, uh, the fact that the posterior parietal cortex doesn't get damaged. Um, and so we came up with this sort of uh, hypothesis uh, the time to resurrection hypothesis for uh, fast versus slow zombies, where you say, okay, look, uh, you look at the movies where you have the walking speed plotted here on the, we totally made this up, walking speed plotted on the y-axis and uh, the resurrection time on the x-axis, that uh, when the resurrection time is very fast, you have fast zombies, and the resurrection time takes days and you have very slow zombies. So there's an incubation period effect here, such that it, it's, that's just making everything up. I can't, I can't, I can't go with it. Okay, so, uh, to end uh, and close out, this is uh, one of the one of the one of the last scenes here of uh, Land of the Dead. Uh, Together, they're mindless walking corpses, and many of us will be too if you don't stay focused on the task at hand. The zombies, man, they creep me out. <laughs> it's a it's a funny movie. I cannot figure out why he picks his nose in that scene. <laughs> Like was that a, was that like an actor's choice at the moment? He's like, I'm gonna like really own this character, and this could be like a character thing or not. But anyway, uh, so that said, this was a really fun exercise to try and figure out like what do we actually know also about neuroscience? Like what do we actually really truly know? Uh, and so a lot of the things that I referenced here, we're like we kind of know uh, the motor control stuff. We we we're pretty sure as a field we've got that under better control. We know the motor control stuff. Like how does the brain give rise to movement? That's one of the better ones. We still don't know why the cerebellum is so big and has so many neurons and what are the computations that it's doing. And also it's probably not just motor control. Oh, oops, it also seems to do stuff in like vision and language and we don't know, it's really complicated. Um, but then you start talking about something like aggression and violence, like I said earlier, and like we really like operationalizing that even scientifically is difficult. The first lab I worked in as an undergraduate uh, at USC, University of Southern California as an undergrad, was a lab studying the biosocial basis of violence. And what they would do is they would take, uh, take people uh, from a population that was more inclined to be violent. So they would uh, put ads out on uh, the equivalent of uh, Craigslist at the time before there was like internet that had Craigslist. Uh, they would put ads out looking for convicted felons to bring into the lab because convicted felons tend to have a like, greater history of violence. And then they would scan their brains and scan the brains of uh, people who hadn't committed violent crimes and then look at the differences. And they're like, well, look, uh, the brains of convicted villains have more activity in this part of the brain when you have the person looking at violent images and healthy, you know, normal, nonviolent population. Therefore, uh, maybe that's the part of the brain that's, you know, responsible for violence. Except the lab head, the guy that ran the lab, the professor, uh, did his brain, and his pattern of brain activity actually looked a lot more like the convicted felons with history of violence than the not. And so he's like, well, wait, well, okay. Uh, I'm not violent, I promise. <laughs> like, uh, so a lot of what we know in neuroscience isn't predictive, right? Just because you have that pattern of brain activity doesn't mean you are a thing X, Y, or Z, right? Uh, and so this is the hardest thing to do in science, in neuroscience especially, which is why a lot of what we know, really truly know, comes from working with these patients, where it's like, okay, if your part of the brain is damaged and you can no longer do a thing, that's really strong evidence that that part of the brain is required to do that thing. And the example I like to give is everything here is correlational. You put somebody in a scanner, you show them pictures, and you say what parts of the brain are more active when they see a picture, right? And so correlations are great, but they're not the end all be all. 
So if I put you on a treadmill and I hook up your, your muscles in your body uh, to EMG to record how much your muscles are working, and I have you run on the treadmill, the faster you run, the more activity you're going to see in the arms. Right? Really tight correlation, nearly perfect correlation. If you run faster, your arm activity is going to be higher and higher. That does not mean the arms or running happens. They might help you a little bit, but you can take somebody that doesn't have arms and put them on a treadmill. I promise you they can run. Right? So correlations in neuroscience are like the de facto thing that we use to study how the brain works. Uh, not everybody, not all the time, but that's a lot of what we know. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it's a little bit morbid and, uh, uh, you know, I've, I've worked with all of these patients that I've talked about. I've, like my PhD was built on working with patients with brain damage, right? And it's not like to trivialize brain damage or anything like that, right? Like these are people who, uh, they've had something terrible happen in their lives, but it's pretty much an, like, it's an incredible honor to be able to work with them, right? Where you have somebody who had a traumatic event and you can say, you know, uh, would you mind working with us? Uh, because you give us this rare opportunity to understand like really how the brain might actually give rise to really complicated behaviors. Uh, and usually they're very happy to, to do something like that, right? It's like turning something awful that's happened into something good, like an actual good experience that they might be able to help scientists. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's it. It's a really fun job. And the only reason I do this kind of thing is to try and convince other people that it's a really fun job and it's actually worth pursuing. Uh, so with that, I'm going to take questions for a little bit and end it there. Thank you, everybody. Nope. Everybody totally believes it. 100% on board. No questions. <laughs> so as a linguist, oh, oh so as oh. a linguist, I'm kind of curious. As a what? what? As a linguist. Oh, okay. As a linguist. <laughs> how gotcha. how would the pulmonary uh, coordination work for? It's really just groans, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> pulmonary coordination. Yeah, because they're probably not using fine tongue motor control. So, the, so the the here. Well, let's see. So we've studied a lot, and this is the best example of like higher language function that we could find. <laughs> so, uh, Return of the Living Dead, by the way, this is like a funny zombie history here. So Return of the Living Dead is the unofficial sequel of the original Night of the Living Dead. So George Romero actually didn't have the copyright to the original Night of the Living Dead. Uh, so lots of people made sequels. There's Zombie 2, Z-O-M-B-I, which is this Italian movie that has the most gruesome scene, I think, in like the history of film. Um, this was The Return of the Living Dead, which is an 80s movie, which was like a joke. Like there's nuclear winter that happens and like there's like dancing sexy zombie at one point. It's a very strange film. It's very 80s. Uh, this group of zombies had just finished eating all of the other humans. Uh, and uh, so a bunch of cops came and then they ate those cops. And so this guy's like, wait a minute, if I go on the radio and ask for more cops, we'll get some more food. Um, so this zombie goes on the CB and asks for more cops. Uh, they're dead. <laughs> like I always go back to George Romero's thing of like, everybody's like, well, how would the brain still work if like X, Y, and Z? And you're like, well, they're dead. Like you have to, like that's the one gimme you have to give us. Um, so fine motor control of like the, the like larynx and the throat and the tongue and all this is probably shot. Right, that's why they only sort of do the uh, 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 and so we think that's probably related to some of the motor issues that they have, but we can't explain this guy. That guy is like, it's way too sophisticated. <laughs> yeah, you had a question? Uh, oh, on the mic, I guess. I was going to ask, oh, so with the zombie brain, and then you just clarified, you know, it's, it's still going, but I'm thinking of in real life, so if you have a person who has gray matter on both lobes and there's still room to be able to create new pathways, mm -hmm. um, so would the same be true to try and get the zombie brain to come back to being a human? That's a great question. Uh, can you, can you like revivify some of the like brain uh, atrophy or something that's happened in the zombies? Uh, so I'm going to actually talk like some real science for a second. Uh, there is, a huge argument in the field is, does the adult mature brain continue to make new brain cells? Like, is that even something that can happen, right? Because we never will have more brain cells and more neurons in our brains uh, effectively than we do at the moment of birth. Um, more is not better when it comes to the brain. Uh, and this is like one of the conundrums of, well, we know if 
neurons atrophy and they die off, that leads to deficits in functioning. But we also know that early in development, neurons dying off are critical for healthy behavior in development. So you have this like paradox of too little is uh, bad and too much is bad. And during development, it's about pruning the ones that we don't need early in development. So uh, we, what we say in like neuroscience is like, your neurons are constantly in a state of trying to kill themselves. Uh, the only thing that prevents neurons from, we say, uh, say undergoing apoptosis, is this uh, where neurons just dissolve. They blub off into little fatty blobs and that's it. That's what they want to do always. In the absence of stimulation from other neurons, they will do that. So inputs into neurons prevents them from doing that. That's the only thing preventing them from doing that. Um, and, but uh, that's critical for development. So if you have too many, it's the whole environment, the, the theory is that it's too noisy. It's overconnected. It's too chaotic in the early developed brain. So maybe and you have sensory integration dysfunction. That's some of the, some of the thinking, right? Um, but if the wrong ones die off, that causes problems. And so the question is, does the new brain develop new neurons? Or does the adult brain develop new neurons? In the certain parts of the brain, it's been shown to be yes, absolutely true. The big question is, does it happen everywhere? Or if you're people with brain damage, can you supplement? Can you help it out? But the trick would be, you want those new connections to be meaningful connections. If you just throw new neurons in a brain, that doesn't mean it's gonna work better. And so, uh, for in terms of rehabilitation, for example, one of the things that uh, during my PhD work I was looking into is how can you leverage the brain areas that are already in existence to uh, help them compensate for deficits caused by brain lesions somewhere else, right? So instead of trying to figure out like, can you biomedically introduce new neurons and hope they connect, right? Can you just let the brain sort of do its thing that it wants to do, which is build these sort of connections and uh, like, can you, can you make that work better, right? So example comes from stroke. Yeah, that causes paralysis. So if the motor cortex is damaged, I'm going to be paralyzed on the opposite side. Historically, what people would then do is like, if I'm right-handed and I'm paralyzed in my right hand, I just have to relearn how to do everything in my left hand. Sort of the newer treatments are the exact opposite, which is if you're paralyzed now in your right hand due to brain damage, you're gonna tie your left hand behind your back so you cannot use it to force, uh, force your paralyzed hand to work again. And the reason that, that we think that works, and it does, it's incredibly frustrating, physical therapy. People who have this stroke hate this process because they're like, I cannot move my hand. And you're like, well, just keep doing it, keep trying. So I think a lot of people know, like left half of your brain controls right half of your body and right half controls the left. That's actually not totally true. 90% of the connections from the motor cortex or so, 85 to 90, cross over to the other side, but 10 to 15 stay on the same side. So can you leverage that 10 to 15% that's on the same side. So I've damaged over here, paralyzed over here. Can you make that 10 to 15% on the same side grow stronger to help out and recover the right hand? And it turns out it does kind of work. Uh, it just takes a really long time. Uh, so in theory, yes, you could. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Oh. What is the rationale behind eating human flesh for zombies? What's the so, rationale for um, zombies to actually oops. eat human flesh? That was one of the harder ones. All right, so again, Shaun of the Dead clip. This is a pretty common trope in zombie movies. <laughs> it, have the zombie, have the human survivors look like zombies and then they won't get attacked. All right, so part of the rationale uh, earlier I'd said, there's a part of your brain called the hypothalamus that's also controlled by the orbital frontal cortex. The hypothalamus, one of the subregions, uh, the ventral medial and ventral lateral nucleus of the hypothalamus, doesn't matter, uh, is critical for uh, appetite control. So if you take an animal and stimulate, <laughs> there's a ton, it, medicine is terrible for this, so I apologize. Uh, there's a ton of like little mnemonic devices in medicine. And so the one for this is, if you stim the lat, you get fat. If you stim the ven, you get thin. So it means if you stim the lateral nucleus of the hypothalamus, uh, the animal will overeat and overeat and overeat until it will actually die. You can do it. Or if you stim the ven, the ventral uh, aspect of it, uh, then it gets thin. So the animal will not eat. So these couple little like hundred, couple thousand neurons in this one part of the brain ca called the hypothalamus are controlling appetite. Uh, and so the mix we argue of 
uh, the lack of appetite regulation, plus this like hyper aggression, plus <laughs> for all of the BS stuff that I'm talking about here, this was like the most BS of the hardest BS to try and BS, okay? <laughs> so uh, here in San Diego, we actually, in the Department of Psychology, there's a really famous uh, neuro, uh, neuroscientist, B.S. Ramachandran, uh, who's a wonderful speaker. Uh, uh, you should probably just have gone to see him talk instead of me talk. Um, and so he has all of these theories about, there's something called the Capgras delusion, which is, uh, it's a neurological disorder wherein you believe your loved ones have been replaced by like robots or pod people or something like that. And we do not know why that happens. And he has this really beautiful theory that we like a lot, which is when I see somebody that I know, not only does my brain register like their physical attributes of what they look like and like, you know, their hair color and their shape and their body size and, you know, their gait and all these things that we use to recognize people. But it's also their smell and all these little subtle cues. And simultaneous to all those visual inputs, the amygdala, the part of the brain that is like tags things with emotional context or like, and I get that little like, I see my wife and I'm like, yay, right? You get that little burst of like, there's an emotional connection too. And so uh, Ramachandran's belief is that the Capgra delusion is caused by a disconnection of the perceptual parts of the brain that recognize the smell and the sound and the sight of the person with the emotional part of the brain that sort of tags those inputs with an emotional context. And so you're like, that looks like my wife, but it doesn't feel like my wife. And this is very common in neurological disorders. Rather than saying, therefore, something must be wrong with me, you say, something must be wrong with the world around us. Uh, this is a very common thing that happens in different uh, sort of brain trauma. Uh, physical trauma is that you attribute the cause not to internal reasons, but to external reasons. And so they'll report they feel like their loved ones have been replaced by, you know, pod people or whatever, right? And so if you have that mixed with this hyper, uh, like hyperactive, uh, like uh, aggression and uh, hunger and all these kinds of things, then all of those things combined lead to rampant cannibalism. And that's why if you pretend to be like them, they're sort of cool with you because you're one of them and you're in the group and it's okay. That's the best we could do. That was the, that was the hardest one for us to come up with. <laughs> you asked the hardest question. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> yeah. Do you think zombies would be distracted by music? Distracted by music? Um, yeah, if it's repetitive, especially. I think so, hmm. yeah. So, EDM all the way. <laughs> you need something that's like constantly capturing attention that's like really beat driven, because that's how that sort of balance thing works, is your attention is constantly being drawn. If it's like smoother and melodic, it's not as like jarringly attention grabbing. Uh, so I think, yes, but it would have to be the right kinds of stuff. Yeah, like glitch may be the best. <laughs> Really glitchy nonsense. Yeah. So zombies can still function this well without all this, with, with all this brain damage. Where in the head do we aim in order to incapacitate them? <laughs> Brainstem. So, okay, I'm like time for like crazy, incredible, weird neuroscience stuff, right? I taught neuroanatomy for several years. And uh, when I first held a brain, like an intact brain and spinal cord, I was really surprised at how small the spinal cord is, right? So I knew from like a neuroscience standpoint that every single sensation that comes into your brain from your body, this huge amount of surface area uh, that we have, all of that comes in through the spinal cord and goes into the brain while simultaneously every signal that goes out to every muscle in our body also goes out through the spinal cord. And you know, you look at pictures of like spinal cords and it's like, you know, the image in my mind is like, you know, your vertebra are like this big, it's really big. The spinal cord itself protected inside of the bony vertebra is only about that, that big. It's super tiny. Like the amount of stuff going in and out is remarkable. Um, and the reason that we know how the spinal cord stuff works, going back to weird history of neuroscience, is actually by this guy named Brown Sicard, who studied uh, people who, he was a, a, a Frenchman, a neurologist in the 1800s, who worked with one of these populations that had a higher incidence of certain kinds of damage, which is people who got into duels, men who got into duels, using either rapiers or guns, and uh, had quite a number of patients who had 
just like half of their spinal cord severed by the tiny little rapiers. Rapiers are so thin that are just like in like a couple inches, just cut half of the spinal cord. So they'd be paralyzed, like on that side, whatever the level of the spinal cord was below, and they'd lose sensory input from like the opposite side of the body was slightly above. And that's how we knew that like the motor stuff coming out of the brain crosses really early and then goes down and the sensory stuff comes in and then crosses in the brain. Uh, and so we could, he, he worked out like where do all these different paths cross? Um, and all of that stuff through the spinal cord uh, controls like movement, sensation. Uh, and of course you have things like heart rate, respiration, those kinds of things too. So sever the brainstem, it's like the final common pathway we say, it's like the last output. If that's gone, you can't do much else. <laughs> All right. All right, Wojtek. Clearly you don't have actual <laughs> zombies to study, but say you did at UCSD, where would you hide them? Where would I Just hide my Theoretically, because clearly you don't have them. The steam tunnels are pretty good, but a lot of kids go down in the steam okay. tunnels, right? And that's maybe like too creepy. That's like asking for it. I think Fallen Star. Oh, yeah. They would, no one would expect that. No one would expect that. Put them way up top there. Just rain zombies down on people. <laughs> All right, last question. Yeah. Yeah, you. <laughs> Wait. You briefly mentioned rabies as yeah. a possible cause. Do you, what do you hypothesize would be like the etiological agent for the zombification? Like what? So what causes zombieism, yeah. right? My favorite, uh, my favorite is a video game called The Last of Us, uh, which is an intense emotional game. And what they take in that one is, uh, there's a fungus called the cordyceps, uh, which is a real thing. Um, and this is a fungus that uh, will infect ants, a certain kind of ant in the part of the world. And yeah, you, you know, you've heard this, right? Uh, and the ants that get this fungus will actually climb up to a tree uh, and they use their jaws to clamp down on the end of the leaf. So they hang their sort of like butts off the end of the leaf and they just sit there and the cordyceps, the fungus grows and grows and grows until the ants pop and rain the fungal spores around the, the sort of like forest floor. And so the idea is that something about this fungus is controlling the ants behavior to cause them to go up to a high place to maximize the spread of the fungus even farther. That we do not, that's just crazy from a biological standpoint that that happens, that somehow there's this fungus that modifies the behavior of a complex animal in order to optimize the spread of the thing. And in The Last of Us in that game, spoilers, uh, sort of, you find out pretty early on. But anyway, that fungus has hopped species into humans and causes human behavior to change, to become like hyper-aggressive, to maximize the spread of the, the fungal agent. Um, there's like one other weird sort of thing, which is um, there's, it's called the jewel wasp. And uh, it actually will, uh, uh, its larva eat cockroaches, like uh, bugs in general, but cockroaches are really good. And so what the jewel wasp does is it will uh, sting a cockroach to sort of paralyze it. And then it injects its stinger into the cockroach. And that like remote control drives the cockroach back to its nest and injects the, uh, like lays its eggs in the cockroach, which is still alive, but now paralyzed. And so its larva can then eat the cockroach. But it somehow has figured out to use its stinger to actually move and remote control drive the cockroach to where it needs to go. So these are like real weird biological things that actually do happen. Uh, and the cordyceps one, unless there's giant wasps, uh, makes, makes the most sense, I think. But I like the rabies explanation a little bit too, but like rabies is a real thing that like actually does affect people and it doesn't do it that way. So, sort of. Yeah, I do have a friend who, uh, he did his talk, he, he worked with, um, uh, what's the Stanford biologist, Sp Sp Spolowski? Sapolsky? Really famous Stanford biologist. Anyway, um, he studied uh, toxoplasmosis Right, so toxoplasmosis is a, a unicellular little whatever, is a protozoa. Um, and uh, it's recommended, for example, that like pregnant women don't clean cat litter um, or touch cat litter because toxoplasmosis, this little protozoa, and actually uh, lives in uh, like cats' intestinal tracts. And that's where it thrives and grows. And uh, it is, um, Rats that get infected with it 
uh, it doesn't like thrive in them, but rats that get infected with it, when cats eat those rats, then they ingest it and then it, it thrives in the cat's intestines. And rats that get infected with it no longer run away from cats. And they're actually attracted to cat urine, which helps this protozoan spread because then they're more likely to get eaten by cats. So it can thrive in the cat's stomach or intestines and then continue to spread, right? And so his argument is, you look at like ancient, uh, ancient Egypt, uh, where you know humans were worshiping cats. He's like, his argument is that the zombie apocalypse already happened. <laughs> it actually happened thousands of years ago uh, and it was due to toxoplasmosis and we are all the result of that. And the reason that we have house cats and everything to this day is that we are all zombified and we are now under the control of all of our cats. That's his, that's his hypothesis. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I don't know where else to end it. We'll leave it at that. Thanks, everybody.